Distance is the number one thing that all new disc golfers want to get. They want to be able to chuck that first beat as far as they possibly can. Today's episode, we are going to be giving you six pieces of advice on how you can throw the disc further. As well in this episode, we will be giving you the best discs that will give you the most distance right away to be able to throw 50 feet further, if not more, just after listening to this episode. Make sure you stay tuned until the end. Let's get into today's episode right now. Trent, how are we doing today, big fella? We got distance on today's podcast. I've been talking to the people on Instagram, and that's what they want to improve most. They want to be able to throw further. I'm excited for today's episode. We've not done one of these in quite a while. Yeah, Quinn, I cannot wait to get to talking distance today. It is going to be great. It's great to be back. Let's get into it. Yeah, and distance is one of those things that a ton of disc golfers are looking to always add and improve upon. I feel like there's never really a moment where you're super happy with your distance. Maybe you're one of those people that are happy with your distance. And it, I think this episode is going to help disc golfers of all skill levels. It does not matter if you are throwing the disc 100 feet or 300 feet. This episode is going to help you throw the disc further. And we've got a ton of great tips to get into it. We've got a tournament coming up that we'll probably be recapping next episode. As well as we've got some interviews in the lineup. They're coming up, guys. I know you guys want to hear some more of them. They are going to happen. We've just had to get through a lot of family stuff medical stuff other things like that i think it's rude to have to reschedule with a guest six right. times so i don't want to bring that i don't want to run the risk right now of doing that but we are going to be getting some more interviews coming on i also i'm breaking the news to trenton right now i haven't told him this yet we're going to be doing an in the bag on YouTube. Let's We're each going to do our own in the bag. We have different discs in our bag. So I think there's value in kind of highlighting what is an amateur's bag look like and how can you maybe progress your own bag and get that big distance, which we're going to be talking about in today's episode. Let's jump into the first piece of advice, the first tip, the first trick that we've got for you guys. It's timing. Nothing matters if you don't have good timing. We have to start here. I believe this is one of the most important things about improving your distance is that if you are unable to time your shot, you will not throw far no matter how big you are, no matter how lanky you are, no matter what disc you have, none of that matters. An idea to kind of draw this to another sport in timing is think about in basketball, right? You have a, a person who is going and they're going to be hitting a jump shot. If they're releasing the ball before they get to the peak of their jump or if they're on the way down or if they have bad timing, the likelihood that they make the basket significantly decreases. So if you have bad timing in disc golf, the likelihood that you're going to be throwing further and further is also going to be decreasing. It's kind of a correlation thing, at least in my opinion it is. So. When I talk about timing, the first thing that I mean is when your front foot, so if you are a right-handed backhand player, this is going to be your right foot. If you're one of those lefty creatures out there, Godspeed, and we're going to be talking about your left foot, okay? So your right foot, when it hits the ground after your X step, where is the rest of your body? Where are you pulling through? All those are questions you need to be asking yourself. If your right foot hits and you're just starting to reach back, the disc is still kind of at your in the middle of your chest, that's bad timing. That's not good. You want your disc to be at the peak of its reach back when your front foot hits the ground. And I think something that's fantastic about this is that you can practice this literally anywhere in the world. You can work on this in your basement. You can work on this on the clock. You can work on this in the field. It does not matter because you can work on getting that arm out all the way reached back at the same time that your front foot is hitting the ground. I think that's just a nice, easy drill. I'm literally doing it right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you see my head moving? It's because I'm doing it right now, okay? So it's one of those things that you can work on that wherever you are. And another key thing about the timing, and I will be talking about head position, and I'll also be talking about the power pocket later on that will tie into this, but another very important part about timing 
is that you're not reaching all the way back with your arm. Your disc, in theory, should not move from your starting point. Your body should move around your disc, okay? The timing piece here is that your disc, your body, are now as far apart from each other as they can be. So your disc is all the way back, your body is all the way forward at the same time that your front foot is hitting the ground. That allows everything else to start to pull through. So if you don't have this timing, here's what can happen. You can get off of your angle control. You can be throwing it very nose up, very nose down, as well as you're not going to be getting the distance you want because not everything's linking up. If your hips fire and your arm is still back, you're not going to be able to throw it far. Half of your body, all your power is already gone. So that you have to remember that the power in your throw, just like in the power from a baseball hitter, comes from the hips, comes from the timing. Think about a baseball player. For me, I was a left-handed hitter when I played baseball. So that's fantastic now that I throw right-handed in disc golf because it's the exact same thing. I see you over there, Trent. Being what? At, w yes, yes, yes. I, I, was a left field. I want to hit some BP. It'd be fun. Yeah, it would be fun. Uh, I, I was a left-handed hitter. So for me, it's the exact same motion, right? So I'm up to the plate. And I want my front foot to be hitting as I have all that power switching, converting to the other side of my body. So everything's on your back hip, kind of like think about it with disc golf. All your power is on that back leg. And then as soon as you hit your front leg on the ground, everything transforms and you start to go into your throw. That's the peak of getting everything going inside of your throw. So as soon as that foot lands, boom. Everything else starts going. It's the same thing with hitting. As soon as that front foot hits, that's when the hips engage. That's when the body goes. You have to have good timing if you want to increase your distance. And I believe that is something you can work on literally the rest of this podcast. Where I challenge you, work on your timing right now if you're in a position to do so for the remainder of this podcast. We will, we'll make sure it's not an hour and a half long, but just give it a little bit of a go. And the more that you can get that timing feeling good and even have a disc in your hand if you want to simulate it being even more real, I think that's only going to help you out with your distance. Trent, talk to me. Yeah, timing, is, does it even matter? Oh, 100% it matters. And I'm going to beat a dead horse. We've talked about it a lot on here, but make sure you are setting that phone up on your bag, on the counter, if you're in the living room, wherever have your wife or your your lady or your significant other hold it for you while you are practicing the timing and this will show you give you a visual representation it might feel like your timing is right and then you watch it back and it's just a, a skosh off and that'll be huge so make sure you're using the phone make sure you're using the camera whatever it might be to keep that in mind but that's all i got for timing i think that is you touch you hit everything else on the head quinn I, I don't got anything else to add there so if you're good i'm gonna go on to the next thing which is angles now this is very important when it comes to getting max distance now the reason it is important is because if you're like me i tend to release everything on a slight hyzer i try to throw flat it's always on a little bit of a hyzer but if you are taking that explorer or that t-bird or the destroyer and you're trying to get max distance with whatever disc it is and it's always releasing on a hyzer and it never really flips up and it just it just holds that that is that is going to be why so what you want to think about when you when i'm talking about angle control is you want to understand first the stability of your disc um so if you're throwing an overstable disc if you're trying to get max distance you are going to want to at least try to release unless you have just ridiculous power um you are going to want to and you highs are flipping it's beat in you're going to want to release that on a little bit of an ante and i guarantee you it's going to add 15 to 20 feet to that throw if you throw Say, for example, since I brought it up, if you throw like an Explorer on a little bit of Annie and you give it enough height to kind of get a full flight, it'll flex out for you and then continue to push. I bet you it goes 15, maybe 30 feet further. And that is going to be true with every disc. If you're taking an understable disc, so let's say we just did a review on the Paradox, you should definitely go check it out. It's an understable mid-range by Axiom. So that bad boy for Quentin and his eyes, you can see in this video, if we released it, Quentin at the very end has a blooper where he throws it on a, or no, sorry. I have a, a blooper where I throw it just really high and on a really bad angle. And it just, it just basically turns over and just burns into the ground off to the right, right hand, backhand. But we found out with understable discs and we've, 
we've learned this just from playing, just like you will learn as you continue to play. You need to release those babies, especially if they're very understable and you can flip them up to flat or maybe get a little s out of them. You want to release that on a hyzer. Now, you've heard people talk about a hyzer flip. Exactly what you, that is exactly what you want to do with understable discs. The hyzer flip is probably my favorite flight in disc golf, and I think that's why I throw everything on hyzer because... And all that really means is you release it on a hyzer, it flips up to flat, sometimes turns all the way over, kind of glides to the right a little bit, right hand, backhand, and then finishes basically dead straight or maybe even left. The hyzer flip is a game changer for distance. But hold on real quick for our newer listeners. Can you explain what a hyzer is so that uh, way they can understand, yes, you know, the call. hyzer flip? So the hyzer is when you release the disc. So take a, imagine the disc is flat. Um, to the ground that is throwing the disc flat if you take the disc and the far side like away from your body this is going to work for right or left-handed throwers the far end of the disc furthest away from you if it is angled towards the ground that and when you're pulling it through that is a hyzer release if it is pointing up like above the pl parallel plane with the earth, surface of the earth or the ground that is anheuser backhand left hand all hands forehand it's, it's all the same um, so a hyzer is when the t toe, the, the end of the disc is pointing towards the ground. When you release it flat is flat, pretty self-explanatory. And anhyzer is when the toe or the, I don't know why I keep calling it the toe, the very tip edge, far edge of the disc is, I don't know, I guess we'll just, for lack of a better, just point it up from the ground. Um, that's an anhyzer, but the point of the whole rant that I'm going on right now is depending on the disc. You want to make sure you are focusing on the angle. And when I say depending, like I said, if it's overstable and you are trying to get max distance, you need to release it on a, either a lot of um, anhyzer, depending on how overstable it is, or at least just a little bit. So it kind of pushes straight a lot further than it usually does. If it's understable or very understable, or if it's beat in, it's like the perfect disc and you can get a hyzer flip out of it, throw it on a little bit of a hyzer. Or if it's it's a stag or something, something that just flies straight and you release it flat and it naturally flips over, that is also a great one for... Um, we're going to talk a little bit more disc selection. Sorry about that. Got into it a little bit early. But that is also a great one for throwing flat and letting the disc work. So just keep that in mind when you're out, when you're out throwing. Pay attention to the angles. If you're wanting max distance and you throw it the exact same every time and wonder why it doesn't change, change up the angle a little bit and see, see how it goes for you. I think something that's also very important to stress about when you're discussing angles is the nose up release. And you hit that a little bit, but if you throw your disc and it just kind of like goes directly up in the sky and then falls down to the left, if you're a right-handed thrower, that's probably an indication that you're throwing nose up. Even if you throw it 200 feet out there, then all of a sudden you kind of see it just kind of lose all its speed and then it just kind of kind of lifts up just right. a little bit and then just kind of torpedoes down into the ground you're releasing with a nose up angle and that is going to be bad and that is honestly a massive killer to your distance yep. so some things that you can do to kind of work around that if uh if you drink coffee this will make sense this is embarrassing for me but i don't drink coffee so for a long time when people were like yeah you got to pour the coffee cup i was like literally what are these people talking about? I don't drink coffee. Trenton, for the YouTube viewers, is demonstrating it right now. I don't do Just, that. Uh, so I didn't know normal? what people were talking about. Wait, normal, and then you're pouring the coffee. I don't want to dump it out, but you just, you cock the wrist a little bit. You basically just create tension in your wrist, and it, it will, I mean, you're not like cocking it back or forward. You're literally just going like, If imagine my arm is straight, as you can see it on YouTube if you're watching, or on Spotify if you're watching, and I just, Tilt my wrist like I'm pouring a cup of coffee. Whoop, whoop. And that's how you want to hold the disc. As you pull it through, it'll keep that the front of the disc down for you. And so you won't stall out like Quentin was talking about. Good call. I forgot to bring that one up. But Quentin's got my back. Yes, sir. I think that's going to be very important because that is something that I know when I started playing with my brother-in-law, Horatio, every time he threw, it would go virtually straight up and torpedo down. 
And that is how I came to really visualize, okay, we have a bad nose angle here. So if that's something that you're seeing in your throw, do just what Trenton said, fix that nose angle and control your angles better to get more distance, boys. We're flying through this thing. We're having a good time. Let's get to the third tip, trick, advice that we got for you. I'm going to be talking about head placement. This is something that I think a lot of disc golfers don't realize and don't think about. I know I'm very bad about this because I have horrible eyesight. I am legally blind. I'm like beyond blind. It's not good. So I, for me, when I was new to disc golf and still to this day, especially if I'm playing by myself, I have to watch my disc the whole time because I'm not going to see where it lands and I'm not going to be able to find it. When I first started playing... If I did not go with my buddy who was just insanely good at finding his his discs in in the woods and my discs in the woods and, and just in the field and things like that, I would have lost so many more discs than I did. So for me, I would throw and before I was even done throwing, you'd see my head turn towards my target and I'm not – looking at the disc. I'm not looking at the ground. My head is completely out of whack. And so again, I'm going to go back to baseball. When you're hitting a baseball, if you're engaging your hips, if you're coming through with your swing and you take your eye off of the ball and you, your head turns somewhere else, your likelihood of hitting the baseball diminishes so much. If you make contact, it's not going to be good contact. Let's apply that to disc golf. If your head is in front of your body, if it's gone, if you've already turned it before your body is thrown, what's going to happen is it's going to be the same thing. Your distance isn't going to be very far and your control probably won't be great either. So what I think you need to be doing is during the entirety of your throw, you know, you want to keep your head kind of level just like your disc is as your body is moving you're not looking toward your target. You're staying down. You're looking down. As you, like I said, got to the timing and you've gotten that front foot down and you're at the peak of your reach back, you want your head to be tucked into your shoulder looking down. Maybe you're looking back a little bit towards your disc and you want to hold it there all the way through the throw, through the power pocket. And as you're releasing and your body's naturally spinning on the heel, that's when you can you know, allow your head with the momentum of your body to look at the target, look at the disc. Some of my best throws and probably some of your best throws are the ones you don't even see the disc for a lot of the flight because you're so focused on that timing and you're so focused on your form that your head is in a good position. Every time that I can just take a deep breath, relax, and just throw with no tension, no pressure, and keep my head cocked down into my shoulder, I feel like my throws go so much better, feel so much further than when I am just ripping that thing as hard as I possibly can. My head's going beforehand. And and if, if you want more visualization, literally look up how Paul McBeth throws, how Eagle McMahon throws. Watch any of the pro players. Watch their head placement. Their head, is 99% of the time, is not going to be in front of them looking at their target on a drive when they the rest of their disc is still behind them or in the power pocket or whatever it is. And if you want another example, just go watch some baseball. Every time a player is hitting a home run dang near, their eye, boom, right there on the ball, their head's in the correct placement, all those things. If your head placement is out of whack, if it's in front of your body, if your timing isn't good, your distance will not be good as well. Right. And the only thing I would add is when you're throwing forehand, obviously you're not, you're not watching your disc. It's a lot different. Keep bringing up baseball. It's baseball. You're, you're looking at where you're throwing a forehand throw forehands for most people are going to be your touch up, up shot type throws. You're usually using something under overstable, not understable. And you're just doing your little 80 to a hundred yard little, you know, after your, your drives, your little up shots. But, when you're throwing power forehands, you are wanting to keep your eyes on the target because that is where everything else is going, just like baseball. But I'm not trying to counter anything you just said. I'm just saying on forehand throws, your head is not going to be doing that. It's going to be looking at the target. So, all right. 
You good on head placement there, Quentin? All right, cool. The uh, next one we are going to talk about is field work. So how to put all of this together. So like I said, you are going to want to record yourself. You don't have to record yourself every throw, but when you're at the field, very important to record, especially when you're working on that timing, like Quentin said, getting the front toe on the ground and starting your pull through at the exact same time. That is going to be huge when you're at the field. So good way to work on that. Grab your bag. Do not worry about how this, and we're going to get to the distance point, but when you're at the field, this is going to help with timing. Grab your bag, record yourself throwing, you know, five, six, seven, eight, however many shots, but do not focus on how far the disc is going. Do not focus on where it's going counterintuitive, but it's not important at the moment. You're worried about timing. Watch that back, make your adjustments until it feels really good. Like Quentin was saying, work on it in your living room and then go to the field and actually throw some plastic. Once you get that figured out, take your timing and worry about your angles. So your hyzer, your flat, your ante, get out there, do the same thing. So this time you're doing the timing. Now you're paying attention to the angle of the disc. You're not paying attention to where it goes. You're paying to attention to the angle when you release it. So to jump ahead a little bit, we talk about head placement and looking down at the disc. So that is going to be a little, it's going to be a little difficult. So you're pulling it through, you're watching it, you're watching it. As you release it and keeping your head down, you're not going to catch the angle because you're not going to look up until after you fully start following through. When the disc is 15, 20 feet in front of you, you can tell if it's on flat, if it's on any, if it's on hyzer. Do the same thing. Record that as well. That is going to be huge. Um, the next thing. We've already talked, or I touched on it a little bit. So we've, we've done timing, the 15, 20 throws, adjusting, do the same thing. Without throwing hard, just your normal routine. Do the same thing with your angles. So you've thrown 40 or so shots. Next thing. Focus on your head placement. So watch the video or just consciously think about what you're doing when you're at the field. Do 15, 20 throws of that. And I guarantee you that is the basics. And then as you continue to go and continue to throw, um, take, uh, take angle control into consideration on the tips we gave you about disc selection. So if you're throwing an overstable disc, do all the things I just said, throw it on Annie and see if you throw it or throw it on hyzer, throw it flat, throw it on any and see which one is further. I almost guarantee you the anhyzer angle when you're at the field is going to be further. Um, understable, throw hyzer, throw flat. Any understable discs are probably going to just burn over to the right and hold on or maybe burn over and hit the ground. Or maybe if you have enough juice, they're going to turn into rollers, but you still want to know because rollers are good to know. Um, and yeah, just get out there and, Basically, when you go to the field, make sure you have a goal in mind. And when you're working on distance, the key is going to be timing, obviously, like we've talked about, the angle of the disc and the overstability or understability of the disc, your head placement, and then getting those reps, baby. Field work is super duper critical. The off season's the best time to do it, in my opinion. And you, I feel like if that's the only thing you focus on, if you don't focus on playing and you just focus on field work, you're, that's where you see your game take leaps and bounds over the off season. And the last thing that I have to say here, my final tip is talking about the power pocket. And I think you can couple this, you need to couple this with your field work because right. it's the best place to work on it. So the power pocket, when I'm talking about the power pocket, you in between like your arms, like in your chestal region. Okay. That's where the disc is. Now, if you are willing and able put out your arm and just take a disc, if you have one, and I want you to, I want you to form like a 90 degree angle for my math guys and gals out there with your elbow, you know, and your, in, in your arm, right? So like your arm should be making a 90 degree angle. If you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, you know, you can kind of see what I'm doing. Okay. So this is where you need to be when you're coming through the power pocket. You need to be hitting this 90 degree angle and pulling through. Your elbow is leading this throw. Your hips and elbow. Go ahead. While while pouring the coffee, that'll keep the nose, the nose angle down. Yes. Good shout. So 
your elbow and hips are leading you through this throw, okay? Not your shoulder. Your shoulder should not be leading. And and when I say elbow, I'm not telling. I'm not trying to tell you to go get like tendonitis or whatever in your elbow. Like your elbow should not be hurting. I'm just saying like your elbow, because you're in this 90 degrees, is going to also kind of be helping to control your angles. So if you're flat and you, your your wrist is flat also with your disc, you're going to throw it flat. But if your elbow is now pointed up you're probably going to be throwing a hyzer. If your elbow is pointed down, you're probably going to be throwing an anhyzer. So if you're coming through and your wrist is higher than your elbow, even if you're on extreme anhyzer, or or excuse me, even if you're on extreme hyzer, you're still going to be throwing an anhyzer because your elbow and your body is directionally going to be going toward the ground, which is how you throw an anhyzer. It doesn't matter how much anhyzer you have with your wrist and and how you're holding the disc, if your elbow's up, you're going to be naturally throwing a hyzer. So it, it's going to become more difficult. So you have to also, with your angle control, understand how your elbow and your arm plays a role in that. So your goal every time you throw should be getting your elbow to that 90 degree mark and coming through and you can literally just work on that. You should be violently coming through with your body. Your elbow should be violently hitting the air, should be pulling, should be just absolutely cannon through there. That is what hitting the power pocket looks like, right? You should be violently spinning. The momentum of your force should be forcing your body and your hips to continue to engage, to spin around, to follow through. And it's important that you follow through. It will hurt your body if you stop the follow through. Allow your body to follow through. And if you're throwing that hyzer, you're going to want to make sure you finish up. If you're throwing flat, you want to finish flat across your body. And if you're going to be doing an anhyzer, you want to be finishing toward the ground. The important thing thing to note here as well is rounding rounding will kill your distance a very key a a great way to know that you're rounding is that you're not hitting this 90 degrees if you're coming through and let's say you uh let's say you're you're taking your disc okay and i think you should be pretty much going straight back in a line like think about an imaginary line your disc should never leave that imaginary line during your throw. If your disc goes off of that line, you're probably having rounding, or if you're not, you're creating extra movement and you're just causing a risk of rounding. So straight line, so where you are, because it's easiest to go in a straight line, you have your, your disc all the way back at the peak of your reach back, you staying on that straight line, forces your elbow to go to that 90 degrees you've got your angle on the disc with your wrist it's curled back and bang you're able to come through generate some spin and get the disc to go where you want it to go get all the distance all that good stuff what does rounding look like you're not on the straight line let's say instead you're tucked a great one is you're tucked behind your your back shoulder you're wrapping your arm around your body It's like a circle, right? So you're wrapped around your body, and then when you throw, you're not on a straight line. Your elbow is never able to get to 90 degrees. Instead, you're physically and like literally, you are throwing the disc in a circular motion. It's so weird to to describe, but you're literally taking it, and you're almost imagine imagine you're a ballerina boys and girls, okay, and you're spinning, okay, so literally the disc is wrapped behind you on your body, and then you're just spinning, that's what you're doing, your elbow's never getting to that 90 degree mark, your elbow, wherever it is, it stays there, but it's just spinning, for my math guys and gals out there, take your protractor, and if you're (laughs) If you're spinning it around, the point doesn't move. Your elbow doesn't move. It stays where it's at with your body, but your body is just spinning, which is causing the disc, instead of it going on a straight line, it's going on a curved line, which a great way to know that you're rounding is that your discs are always shot off to the right. If grip lock honestly probably doesn't exist, you just rounded that time that you threw. Grip lock is a myth. It's really just your rounding. 
If you're hitting at 90 degrees, it is so hard. If you hit the power pocket correctly, it is honestly very difficult for you to grip lock. I mean, you have to hold on to that sucker for a long time, but if that's the case, then you weren't violent enough with your reach back and your pull through. You weren't throwing it hard enough. And I'm not trying to tell you to muscle up and throw it very hard. I'm telling you that the momentum your body had was not enough or you have such great grip strength that you just absolutely yanked it over to the right. Sure, that can happen. But I think most of the time when you have grip lock, it's because you're rounding. It's because you're literally throwing that disc to the right on a circular plane instead of a straight line plane, which causes rounding and that kills your distance. How is your disc going to go far if it never even has a chance? If it doesn't matter what disc you have, which we're going to talk about next, the best discs for distance, it doesn't matter if you throw any of those discs. If you're rounding, if your head's not in the right place, if your angle control is bad, if you're not going in the field, and if you're not having good timing, if you're not hitting your power pocket, none of those things matter. Literally none of those things matter because you're not going to be able to get distance. If you throw something incredibly overstable, just a bullet to the right, maybe it gets out of it and you can get some distance, but you're not going to have good control. If you throw something understable that way, you could get a roller or it could just go off into another dimension to the right. So you have to make sure, boom, hitting that 90 degree angle and you're coming through on a straight plane and your body is angled toward where you want to throw. You want to throw a hyzer? Okay, your elbow's up. You want to throw the anhyzer? Your elbow's down. If you want to throw flat, you're staying at that 90 degrees. And you're positioning your body and your throw on the tee pad or in the field the direction you want the disc to go. If you want to throw something to the left, don't position your body to the right. You know what I'm saying? Don't play the slice like golf in disc yeah. golf because it ain't going to yes. work. <laughs> if you're playing the slice like you do in golf that that's bad that is that is bad you will not be able to get good distance from that you will not have good control from that overall the slice is not nice in disc golf Definitely not and i think what i what i would add to this is this is really what helped me put this together um imagine your arm is a catapult the base of your arm the shoulder all it's really doing is staying staying put the rest of your arm, the elbow, the wrist, the hand is the end of the catapult. And that is what is generating all the power. So when you are muscling up, when you're trying to throw far, but you're just tense because you're, you know, I'm going to throw this 700 feet, baby. Hey, honey, watch this throw. And you muscle up and then you open your shoulder early and you round. And like Quentin was saying, it goes 40 feet offline to the right, but it's overstable. So it works its way back to straight. That is that is that is no bueno. You're 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 hurting yourself. Following through is huge. But for me, the thing that really helped me put it together was imagining the power pocket and your arm as a catapult. And I think I said it already. But one way to also tell if you're rounding when you record yourself, if when you're watching everything looks really really good and you're pulling straight, and the disc is going down a straight line, and then all of a sudden you open your shoulder, you see your upper body turn early. That is rounding, and your disc is going to go off to the right. So focus on that pointing, that, that lead shoulder, right, left, whatever it is. Focus on keeping that where you're wanting to go, and then do not muscle up. Relax. It's hard to do. Trust me. Very hard to do. But the, the more you can relax your arm as you pull it through, the more snap, the more whip, the more whoppa catapult action you can have, and that will be the, dis the difference in the distance, baby. So that's what I got on that. I think you nailed everything else. So, all right, let's talk disc selection. Now, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but here are a few discs that for me personally, I've thrown that I noticed I got more distance out of than anything else throughout my whole career. So the first one is going to be I am going to talk about my beloved Stag. It's a green disc. I throw in a lot of the videos. This thing is very high glide. I think it's got a six glide. It's only like a seven or eight speed. Maybe it's a nine speed. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I think it's a six glide. I think it's a zero one or it's a negative one one maybe. So essentially it's just a stable disc. 
And this is going to be a very good fairway driver for you to attempt to get max distance. Um, that thing goes probably further than most of my other discs. And as I get a little bit better, my arm speed goes up, I can jump up. So the next disc I would recommend is going to be a Mamba from Innova. This is going to be a very understable, I believe it's a 12 speed. So yes, it's a higher speed. 11 12 uh, 11 12 it's in the anyway range. it's a it's little a bit higher speed driver but it is very understable so the lower arm speed guys this is gonna most likely just go straight and then finish a little bit to the left if at all to the left It'd probably just go straight for you now you hire you uh, higher speed people this is probably gonna be a fantastic disc just like um the stag this will be fantastic for hyzer flips if you got a little bit quicker arm Throw it on a slide hyzer, let it flip up, and just push straight and finish a little bit left. Now, in the mid-range game, I'm going to bring it up again. We just reviewed it. I've only thrown it. Every time I've thrown it was in that video, and you saw every throw that I have, and I love it. I don't have one, but I'm going to get one. The Axiom Paradox. Now, people have uh, suggested like a Hex by MVP, which I have one of those. I think it's not as understable, but it is a very good disc mid-range wise but if you're wanting max distance and you're an amateur i think the paradox with by axiom discs is going to be fantastic especially when you're working on angle control but that baby goes it glides it has plenty of glide it flips up a little bit for you if you got the power if not it's just going to push straight um and yeah and then another one by uh, i believe it's west side is the underworld this is a very understable so I already gave you a West Side Stag. That's just a stable, straight flyer, high glide. But anything with high glide is fine. I'm just giving you a few suggestions here. Um, anything high glide is going to help your distance game because, well, I'll take that back. If you take a disc that is high glide but overstable, which there really isn't very many, but like two stability even, if you don't get it up to speed, it's not going to fly right. So that's going to be the key. So if it has like a six glide but it's two stability, if you don't have the power to get it to flip up a little bit, it's not going to finish like you want it to. It's probably just going to hold the hyzer or it's going to just finish left like everything else. But when you take like a 7, 8 speed underworld fairway or 7, 8 speed disc that is like negative 2 to negative 3 under stability which, or uh, turn, which is the third number, which that's a good thing to talk about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on it real quick. The first number you see on the disc from left to right is going to be the speed. It's usually going to be between 1 to 14 if you're crazy. High speeds. The next uh, next one is going to be glide. It's usually 0. I don't even think there is a 0, but I would just, I mean 0. I mean tilt's probably a 0. 0 to like 7 maybe. It's probably max glide. I don't know. The next one's going to be turn, which the lowest I've ever seen is negative 4 or 4. It doesn't really matter if it's negative or not. That is going to be the understability. That's the number you want to look at for understability. And then the next one is fade. So the fourth disc left or the fourth number left to right is the fade. And that is the st the overstability of the disc. That's going to be like zero to I think the tilt's like a six or five or something. Point being, you want to find stable to understable discs for max distance with high glide, and you will throw bombs. What do you got, Quentin? I will start with the paradox. I am somebody who throws naturally Anheuser release, I think. And I think that's due to bad Agreed. form sometimes. Something I'm working on, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, or maybe that's just how I throw and I kind of throw like Ricky. I haven't quite determined in my head yet. But – uh, the, so like a fuse, for example, I've struggled to throw a fuse. I've struggled to throw an origin because they're a little bit understable and I just end up turning them into rollers. So far, I have not struggled with the paradox. I've done that a couple of times, but I think I've also been working on the angle control to make it better. The paradox, I threw this thing so far. I, ah, oh, man, I wish I had the clip of it. I had this, I had this gap to throw through. You couldn't really throw a hyzer because unless you just absolutely pierced it, you would end up in the woods on the left. I mean, the gap's maybe 15 feet wide. If you turn it over, you're in the woods on the right, and throwing straight's the hardest thing to do in disc golf, especially higher speed discs. So I take the paradox. Thanks. I throw this thing so far to the left. It goes out there, flips up, drifts to the right, and is 10 feet from the basket 
Meanwhile, the drive that I actually threw on that hole was 45 feet to the left in the woods. So the paradox is freaking awesome, man. I'm a bit, I'm a big, big old fan of that thing. So I think that's a great one. Uh, some other good discs that I think I am not going to recommend to you distance drivers because I think for a lot of newer players, even players of Trenton, uh, myself's level, I feel as though the distance driver sometimes can be just a little bit too much in demand like too demanding to be able to throw it as intended like trenton was talking about with the flight yeah. numbers yeah. so i think i'm gonna spit stick more to like that seven to nine range the heat is a really good one by discraft it's understable i think it's like a nine six negative three one so there's a little bit of fade back to it at the end but it's going to be understable for the most part I think the Roadrunner by Innova is another great one. It's understable. I've personally given this to a lot of my newer or lower arm speed disc golf friends, and they love it, and they play really good with it. So I think those are two fantastic discs you can choose. I think the F3 from Prodigy is money, money in the bank. The Explorer is pretty good, even though it's a little bit more on that overstable side. But I angles. Also, exactly. So if you're working on that Anheuser angle or if you're working on that Heiser flip angle, you know, I think both of those work with it. So I think those are some good discs. I do think the Origin is a good mid-range. The Buzz is a good mid-range. So you, you have to think about things that – what can you realistically throw? Are you a higher skill player that can – jam on nine plus speed discs you can get a uh like an escape from dynamic discs you know something that's like nine five negative one two to three like can you get something like that to flip up to flat and turn to the right if yes then yeah keep working with that keep working with those higher speed discs and you'll continue to grow and elevate your game by doing everything else we've talked about in this podcast if but if you're somebody who throws Let's say a stag that Trenton was talking about. It's understable, but it there is no understability to it, right? It never goes to the right. It never flips up. It's just a hyzer machine. You need to disc down some more and really work with those mid-ranges because the more you go to the field, you'll find your mid-ranges and your fairway drivers maybe 30-foot difference. Sometimes you need that, but if you can be more controllable with those mid-range discs, and you're not putting as much strain as your body, you don't even have to throw it as hard because the speed rating's not as high, it might be better to go to some of those mid-ranges. When you can learn, and, and this is another thing you can go to the to your course and do, don't bring any of your distance drivers. Just bring putters and mids and play the round like that. Just do that. And then the next time that you bring those discs and you get to a hole where you're like, oh, wow, I used to throw a destroyer here. And you're like, yeah, now I can get there with my paradox. That's crazy. That's insane to me, right? Do those things. Those things will help you be a better disc golfer and get more distance. When you play the round with those lower speed discs and you're able to show yourself you can get there, you don't have to be hurting with a 12 speed that's too fast for your arm that's going to make it so overstable you're not able to actually get any distance, right? See what I'm saying here? You want to have those lower speed discs, learn from them, jam with them, and the next thing you know, you're going to be going up to... to Holes that are 300, 330, 350, and you're going to be like, this is literally a piece of cake. I can get there with my mid-range. That is going to happen with you if you trust the podcast, if you trust the process, if you subscribe to the and podcast. The podcast. <laughs> yes. Fumbled the bag on that one, but, uh, you know, talking is hard sometimes. When you're blind, not everything else works for you, I guess. So that's it. I think, Dunskies. Me, what else I do you got, I got, Trent? I got one more thing. I think it was the Heiser, not Chris Smith, brought it up. Uh, especially courses in Wichita, but it's probably true for courses all over the country. There's at least the, for the, the main courses that everyone plays. Not everyone goes out and plays the Northwood Blacks of the world. But for the most part, every hole that you come across could probably be attacked with a mid-range if you trust yourself and believe in that disc. And you might surprise yourself how you can do it. So get out there and play. But yeah, and... and Hey, the Thursday video this week, two mids. We each got two mids, and we're going uh, two mids and a putter, and that's that's the challenge. So check that out on Thursday. But Sad. That's, a, that's all I wanted to add. That's all I wanted to add. 
was just a yeah. little little Heiser not shout out and then trust your mid ranges. They uh believe it or not, they're amazing. So hashtag trust your mid range. Comment down below if you're still with us on YouTube. What is your favorite mid range disc? And we will see you guys next week. <laughs>